So our next guest has come a long way to be with us today. It's my privilege to introduce Drew Hatter. Drew currently serves as government relations officer at the Michael J. Fox Foundation for Parkinson's Research. As a member of Michael J. Fox Foundation government relations team, Drew advocates federal legislators and government to accelerate the development of new, improved Parkinson disease therapies and increase quality of life for people with Parkinson disease and their families. This includes the National Plan to End Parkinson's Act and policies supporting caregivers and long-term care services for those with PD. Prior to Michael J. Fox Foundation, Drew worked in government affairs at the American College of Obstet Obstetricians and Gynecologists. He also worked at the U.S. House of Representatives as a legislative assistant in the office of former Congressman Steve Stivers, where he advised congressmen and served as primary point of contact on health-related policy and legislation. Drew attended The Ohio State University, where he received a Bachelor of Arts degree from Glenn College of Public Affairs in Public Management, Leadership, and Policy. Drew is here to rally us to do more than just live with Parkinson's disease. We need to end it. Please give a warm Wisconsin welcome to Drew uh Hatter. Perfect. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be with you during Parkinson's Awareness Month as well, which sort of, I think, ties in nicely to my presentation here about advocating for Parkinson's policies, um, as well as we'll talk a little bit more about the national plan as well, which is something that I personally work a lot on with the Michael J. Fox Foundation as well. And I'm trying to see if there's a, ah, there we go. Thank you. Perfect, I had to get my little clicker tool here. Perfect, yeah, so as was mentioned, again, I'm Drew Hatter, Government Relations Officer at the Michael J. Fox Foundation. And so what does that mean, Government Relations Officer? You may hear Government Affairs Manager, Government Relations, right? Yes, this does mean I am a lobbyist. Um, that is uh, perhaps a dirty word in some circles, so don't judge me on that, but it is the work that I do working with our federal government, specifically on my end, but my team as well works with our state and even local at times. Times. Perfect. So I think most of you are probably familiar with the Michael J. Fox Foundation for Parkinson's Research, but if not, right, uh, we were founded in 2000 by actor um, and advocate, I will add, Michael J. Fox. Uh, again, founded in 2000, Michael J. Fox was diagnosed with Parkinson's at the young age of 29, so he does have young onset Parkinson's disease. Um, in the foundation, we are dedicated to finding a cure for Parkinson's disease, that is our mission, um, and it's through an aggressively funded research agenda, and to ensure the development of improved therapies for those living with Parkinson's today um, as well. And I think I was teed up quite nicely walking up here. I know something that we say at the foundation quite a bit is that we, uh, we're here until Parkinson's isn't. Um, and we do, we do mean that. We try to back that up. Um, and so some statistics from us. We've funded now more than $2 billion, billion with a B, um, in Parkinson's research around the globe. I'm um, excited to keep that number ticking upward on our end. And that means we've supported more than 3,200, 3,200 Parkinson's uh, uh, research projects uh, by academics, biotech, and pharmaceutical companies. And something that I think is pretty impressive that our team likes to talk about um, a lot, I'm no mathematician, but I think this stands out to me pretty clearly, 88 cents um, of every dollar um, that we raised does go directly to research, which I know we're quite proud of and are always trying to do better there as well. Perfect, so what am I here to talk about today quite a bit? I think it was, it was teed up. Um, it's about advocacy, particularly about advocating to our policy makers, our elected officials, right? Our state, federal, and local governments. So why even advocate, right? I think that's a, that's a very, valid, very valid question, particularly in these politically divisive times. There's a lot of things on the news that just aren't so fun, right? So I think sometimes it can be easier to check out, and I certainly don't blame anyone there. But, you know, when I think about the question of why advocate, right, there's some different analogies or, or sayings, right? You may have heard closed mouths don't get fed, right? Or if you're not on the table, uh, or excuse me, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu, right? 
or another one for maybe our Hamilton musical fans, right? You want to be in the room where it happens, right? To get things done, you want to be in the room, you want to be part of the conversations, kind of see the change that you want to see, right? And so when we define advocacy, kind of an easy way to think about that, right, is it's an activity done by either an individual or a group and that, that uh, aims to influence decisions or build public support for a particular, for a particular policy, policies or causes, right? And so these particular groups that we're advocating to quite often, again, are elected officials. They may be folks in the Biden administration or they may even be your state, local elected officials um, in some of those departments and agencies as well. And some of these causes, I think you can see up here some of the common causes, right, it's by no means exclusive, uh, but increase and diversified uh, funding for Parkinson's disease research and supports and resources that are needed. Just raising general awareness. I don't think I have to convince anybody here the need to raise uh, more awareness, even amongst our own community, but definitely outside of it for Parkinson's disease as well. Again, supporting research. I mean, importantly, I know we talk a lot about finding a cure and our gold standard, our holy grail is of course finding that cure, but that doesn't mean that we don't focus quite a bit and all the time on increasing um, the therapies, treatments that are available for those living with the disease today or who may soon be diagnosed, right? Very, very important. And so all of these things, they lead us to our ultimate goal, right? Prevention um, and ultimately an accessible and affordable cure. I think that's important to point out, something that government um, is very well poised to stand in, making sure that these treatments um, these therapies, one day the cure, right, are affordable and accessible. I wish it was always that simple, but sometimes it's not. Perfect. And so on our end at the foundation, we're keeping track of some of the policy wins that we've even seen just in 2023. You know, 2023 has been a really exciting year um, that's gone past, and we're excited to doing more here in 2024 as well, but on top of all of the great research breakthroughs that hopefully you've heard of, um, right, in, in the past year, we've discovered a biomarker for the first time ever uh, for those living with Parkinson's, a misfolded protein in the brain that now for the first time ever, we can sort of have a biological tool, a test, um, to see how the disease presents, progresses, um, and something to also use in clinical research, right, to be able to test these therapies, treatments, um, and devices against and see how they respond. For the first time ever, we're what I know our researchers like to call the biological era of Parkinson's research. So instead of the many decades of the main way that we do research and study um, that's available to us, right, of looking at the outward symptoms, um, which as we know, many of the symptoms of Parkinson's are not so very outward, um, very inward and non-motor symptoms definitely present a challenge in clinical research. So now we have a biological tool, some hard data, some science to finally um, start seeing some acceleration of the clinical research that we're doing. So on top of just the research advances that we've seen, of which that is a huge one, we've also been thinking a lot about the successes that the public policy team that we, my team, um, has had in sort of supporting policies and legislation for the Parkinson's community. And I think the big one top of mind for me is at the end of last year, in mid-December, we were able to get the National Planned and Parkinson's Act passed out of the United States House of Representatives, which was fantastic by an overwhelmingly strong vote, well over 400 votes, um, which I will say in this uh, political climate these, day, uh, these days and uh, this age, it's really hard to get 400 people in the United States Congress to agree on anything, let alone just a few. And so, as a part of our real, and I, you know, I'll talk a bit more about the National Plan in Parkinson's Act. Hopefully, many or some of you are familiar, and if you're not, I'll talk a little more about it. But in our efforts to continue to advance the National Plan in Parkinson's um, and to build support for it, our team, we've been undergoing, we, we, we try to get 15 to 16 meetings a week uh, with elected officials, and those aren't just all on me. They're shared by my wonderful team as well. Uh, but in 2023 alone, in these weekly meetings that we do, we've had over 500 meetings um, with elected officials' offices. And in those 500 meetings, 
We've had over 1,000 advocates join us, and we really, really try not to do these meetings without recruiting, without having wonderful advocates like all of you in this room join us, constituents of those districts you know, that live, work, have family in the areas that um, these elected officials are representing, be able to put a human face um, on Parkinson's. You know, I can go into an office and I can talk about my statistics and my numbers and you know what I think the federal government should and shouldn't be doing but it's not until sort of the uh, the advocates able to come in and share that human element about why is research so important you know it's not just about extra money it's about the quality of life right and so also kind of thinking about our state level some of the wins we've seen over 15 states um, have passed legislation to support uh, the Parkinson's community um, as well. Unfortunately, the state government advocacy is not my specialty, or I would go a little more into that, but one of our colleagues uh, would always be happy to talk to you about the wonderful bills that they've been working on as well. And even more on the, the regulatory side of things, the federal, um, the administration side of things, with the EPA, they're finally the Environmental Protection Agency, starting to pay attention uh, to some of the dangerous pesticides and chemicals that I think you know, science has shown to be linked to an increased cause for Parkinson's, including a proposed ban of TCE, trichloroethylene, I do believe, if I butchered that, apologies, um, a proposed rule out there, as well as taking a harder look um, at the pesticide paraquat um, as well. And so this has all come after many decades of advocacy and outreach um, to the EPA, um, taking to try to take a harder look at these chemicals. And there's more work to be done there, and particularly with other chemicals and substances, but I think important to point out as well. Perfect. So wanted to talk now a little bit more about how we advocate, right? And so there are so many ways to make our voices heard. I think sometimes it can be a little overwhelming just to think about how or what is the best way. And there is, there is no wrong way, uh, but some of the ways that, you know, we find um, that work and to try to expertly cut through the static um, when it's needed most so that we can accomplish our goals for the Parkinson's community. And so again, advocacy, it's a combination of tactics that we use, which includes the recruitment. I mentioned recruiting advocates in the meetings um, that we have, training these advocates, advocates and engaging and continuing to steward um, them and to find those that have a connection and a passion um, for addressing Parkinson's um, and providing you know, better policies for the community as well. And so some of these audiences that we look at, it's any and all, and it's one of my favorite things about this is to be able to convene and bring together different audiences um, in our efforts um, to address policy. And so that includes the Parkinson's community, the PD community. I think we could all safely classify ourselves in one big community there. But you know, more specifically, it's about the, the providers, the researchers, the patients, of course, but also family, the care partners, um, and even our corporate partners. So as I look around today and I walk through the exhibit hall out there, I think that's just a fantastic example of the different audiences and who can be an advocate um, that I'm talking about. Perfect. So I've talked a little bit about our policy team. It's our public policy department the Michael J. Fox Foundation. We are separated into three teams um, with different areas of expertise and scope, and so I'm a member of the federal team. Again, that means that I advocate to and I try to influence, educate, serve as a resource um, to our federal government agencies, United States House of Representatives, the United States Senate, right, and the Biden administration or the presidential administration. Right, and so we work with Congress to advance Parkinson's research, increase funding, and improve the overall well-being of the Parkinson's community. Secondarily, we have our state team, uh, and you know, in the, that exists to um, work with state legislatures, such as here in Wisconsin, right, governors and the state agencies to support Parkinson's research and care funding. So a lot of the similar goals and aims. It's just a different group of people and a different government agencies um, that we're trying to interact with. And then thirdly, and I think is one of the most important pieces of all of this, we have our advocacy um, team. And really our advocacy team um, supports all of our policy work. It's really kind of the glue that holds all of us together uh, by working, again, directly with Parkinson's advocates, recruiting, training, and connecting um, all these different advocacy opportunities that we may have um, that folks can participate in. So really, really serving as the glue for any and all things that we want to do there. 
Perfect. So now that I've kind of laid the groundwork a little bit, I'll start with our federal um, government policies and priorities. I'll talk a little bit more um, about each of these um, areas that I think you'll see up here um, in just a second and kind of provide some different information on some policies and issues that our team is working on, again, with the federal government, United States Congress, um, and the Biden administration. Um, and I'll start off um, even with some of my own work um, here, which again is the National Plan to End Parkinson's Act. I hope that some folks are familiar. Actually, I'd like to see a raise of hands. If you're familiar with the National Plan to End Parkinson's Act, why don't you raise your hand? Okay. All right. I'm glad it's not zero. That means I haven't been doing a terrible, terrible job getting the word out there. So perfect. So maybe we can all learn a little bit more about it today. So the National Plan to End Parkinson's Act, right, it is our priority policy uh, for the Michael J. Fox Foundation, and it's H.R. 2365, if you're curious, that's the House of Representatives bill, as well as S. 1064, that's the Senate bill. We have two bills, they'd say the same thing um, in each chamber of Congress, and so what is it, right? I'll get right to it. It's the first federal legislation that's solely dedicated to treating, preventing, and curing Parkinson's disease, right? So I like to liken it to sort of the cancer moonshot, um, if you heard about it. So one of these large sweeping federal initiatives, right, to address a problem. Actually, speaking of cancer moonshot, I even like to think of it in times of our actual moonshot, our effort to get to the moon um, in the 60s and into the 70s, right? These sweeping federal initiatives. We've done it with cancer. We've done it with important issues like HIV, AIDS um, as well. And so what this bill actually does, what it does in practice, right? It directs the Secretary of Health and Human Services um, in the uh, Biden administration to develop a, a national plan to end Parkinson's. We didn't really reinvent the wheel um, when we named the bill there. And so the practical part of that plan and kind of the, the working arm of that is that it establishes an advisory council. Think a committee, a task force, whatever you wanna call it, we call it an advisory council, right? And it, it, um, it is comprised of the, the federal members, a lot of your usual suspects, if you're familiar with some of our important healthcare officials in the country, those that work for the Centers for Medicaid, Medicare Services, right? The National Institutes of Health, the Department of Defense, Veterans Affairs, even the EPA, the Office of Minority Health, the list kind of goes on and on, and the, the members of that are, are detailed in the bill specifically. But importantly, and I think really important for our community as well, there's a whole host of non-federal members that'll be elected to this advisory council as well. And so those include, of course, people with Parkinson's, right? Physicians, researchers, those in the industry, corporate partners, right? But I think really importantly, and something I always like to focus on when I'm talking about the bill, is that also includes care partners um, as well to really bring um, that incredibly valuable element to the conversation um, and the consideration there as well. And so, I think you know quite often we get the answer, and we should always be prepared to answer it. Is why why this legislation, right? Why the national plan in Parkinson's? Why does our federal government need to be tasked with looking at Parkinson's? Well, I don't think I necessarily need to convince anybody in this room why more investments and different attention to Parkinson's is needed. But I think it's a fair question, right? First of all, we know that it's a proven approach and that it works is because Alzheimer's, the Alzheimer's community, has already done just this. They did this 10 years ago. The National Plan to End Parkinson's Act is modeled after very successful legislation that the Alzheimer's community did. It's a National Alzheimer's Project Act. That was signed, to law, signed into law back in 2011, right? And I think if you've been paying attention, it's uh, for the Alzheimer's community, they've not only seen just an exponential, a skyrocketing growth um, in funding, they've gone from the hundreds of millions of dollars to now yearly they're receiving billions with a B um, in, in funding from the federal government. But they've also seen increased attention, increased awareness, right? Even increased, which is particularly important for my line of work, increased legislative action. There's been so many follow-up bills um, and different policies aimed at the Alzheimer's community. And that's absolutely fantastic. It's not at all a competition. There's none, uh, no hard feelings whatsoever there. In fact, as we all know, being neurodegenerative diseases, you know, it's sort of a rising tide that lifts all boats, right? Particularly with a lot of the overlapping biology, the pathology, 
but even something like the dementias and the co-occurring dementias that happen in the population. Absolutely a good thing, but we just see this, the National Plan in Parkinson's Act, as a proven approach to get some attention for our community. I think second in that, in that line of thinking, another thing to point out, um, and again, not, to, not saying this to shame anybody, right, but Michael J. Fox Foundation, we're just one, one piece, you know, of funding Parkinson's research in this country, right? But the foundation itself, we now today actually fund about twice of what the National Institutes of Health, the biggest funder of Parkinson's disease research, is funding for Parkinson's. I'll just say that again. We're funding twice what the government, just us, funding twice what the government is funding for Parkinson's disease research. And so certainly, oh, I appreciate that. But again, not just about our funding. There's so many other great folks in this space that are doing the same. But just to illustrate that, right, we definitely want to raise the parity there and kind of bring that back into line. I think it's when I'm at a great event like this and I see all the fantastic people that are here, the work that's being done, I'm so encouraged, I'm so optimistic, but I think we recognize that the federal government needs to step up and step in as well here. So that's one of the biggest things that we're, we are focused on. And so kind of where is the bill, right? I mentioned that it passed out of the House of Representatives in mid-December, which was fantastic. It was so, so great to see. That means we're about half done right now. Actually, we're exactly half done. So that now means that the United States Senate has to get their act together and get the bill moving, right? And there's a lot of different things going on. If you've watched the news, you know that a million and a half things and different priorities are up in front of this country. But we've been having some really, really great conversations um, in the United States Senate and see um, some hopeful and optimistic signs that we could get this bill moving before too long. And so of the 100 United States senators that are in the U.S. Senate, we have 41, actually 42, if you count our lead co-sponsor in support of the bill. So we're almost to half, and we're going to keep that going. I will note um, that, unfortunately, as of yet, um, we've yet to secure the Wisconsin senators, Senator Baldwin and Senator Johnson. So we'll talk more about you know ways you can be involved, put in a call, write a letter to them. We'd love to see them hop on. But the next step for the bill um, is it has currently been assigned to the HELP Committee in the United States Senate. That stands for the Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee. They have a pretty, pretty broad jurisdiction of issues um, that they work on just in their title and their acronym there. So we're working hard trying to get on their calendar, get on their schedule to have a hearing for the legislation, which once they can have the hearing, once folks can vote on it, Next step is it goes to the Senate floor for a vote. Once that's successful, it heads to the president's desk and we'd have ourselves um, a law or an act. So we're almost there. We just need to keep, keep going. I think we've seen some really fantastic momentum just here in Parkinson's Awareness Month. Most recently, we had Senator, and I should say Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, the highest ranking United States Senator and in line for the presidency. He jumped on to co-sponsor the bill, which is a huge signal of support for this and really lends me uh, some optimism that we're going get to this, get this thing done. Pardon me while I get my notes up because it went to sleep. Perfect. So that's the National Plan in Parkinson's Act. And, you know, I hope uh, by visiting some of the resources um, that we have online and if you want to talk to me outside after, always more than happy to talk about it. But I also want to talk about um, some other priorities, particularly in our federal space that we work on. And of course, not least of that um, is funding, P uh, funding Parkinson's research. And in particular, um, in states and on Capitol Hill, we do advocate for government funding for our Parkinson's Progression Markers Initiative, PPMI. I'm sure many of you may be familiar with PPMI. You may be a participant in that study. Um, and if so, that's great. Thank you so much. Would encourage definitely others to join if they would be willing. I um, mean, this study follows people with and without Parkinson's. It's important to have both of those populations to look at for a research study um, to learn more about how the disease starts and changes over time. It's a massive, massive study. It's what we call a longitudinal study, right, to follow large cohorts of people over a long period of time. Very important. It studied thousands of people across the globe. Over 40,000 volunteers have uh, shared data with PPMI through its online platform, and more than 2,500 participants have tests um, and have shared biological samples 
um, at over 50 medical centers um, in 12 countries. So very sweeping program and we're working um, on the federal and on the state level to get creative about some ways that we might be able to provide some, um, some funding and support uh, for that research program. And more broadly um, as well, federal funding for Parkinson's disease research. I think there's, of course, three big buckets of programs that we're currently advocating for. It's not, again, it's not an exhaustive list. It's not all inclusive, but things that we're working on right now as we look at the next federal budget. Um, one of which is the Parkinson's Research Program, the Department of Defense, and their congressionally directed medical research programs. That's a lot of, a lot of different words, a program and an acronym within an acronym within an acronym. Right, but uh, that's a program that is uh, definitely focused on our servicemen and women, our active and um, retired men and women. Um, and that research not only benefits our servicemen and women, but it has high impact, high value outside of the community um, as well. We also champion sustained and increased funding um, for other programs like at the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and their National Neurological Conditions Surveillance System say that three times fast, um, which is a really important um, collector of data and information that be, can, can be used quite broadly for Parkinson's research. And as well, um, kind of also in the defense space, but with the Veterans Affairs um, Administration, sp uh, specifically the Centers of Excellence for Parkinson's is, that they run, we're quite supportive of that program and trying to keep, excuse me, sustained and robust funding for that as well. Talked about it a little bit earlier as well, something we also are always watching um, and active in is the work around environmental risk factors for Parkinson's. Of course, I'm sure many of you are aware that there are quite a few, unfortunately, of environmental risk factors. Uh, many of them are chemicals, pesticides, right? We talked about paraquat, I talked about TCE, um, even something as simple as drinking well water, which is probably related to the pesticides um, that I've mentioned um, is a risk factor for Parkinson's. Particulate air matter, unfortunately in the world we live in, the list goes on and on. Right, so as I mentioned, after decades of advocacy by not only by us, but a broader community um, as well, there's a proposed ban on TCE, on trichloroethylene, as well as some different considerations around paraquat. Um, and another very recent uh, bill that's been introduced that we are very, very excited to be supporting, it's called the Healthy Brains Act, um, introduced by Congresswoman Jennifer Wexton. And if you are familiar with Congresswoman Wexton, She's been a wonderful advocate for us. Unfortunately, she has been diagnosed about a year and a half ago with PSP, progressive supranuclear palsy, a very aggressive form of Parkinson's or a Parkinson, uh, Parkinsonism. Uh, but in that time, she has been such a wonderful advocate for us and for the community. Uh, but what this legislation does, um, creates new centers of excellence at the National Institutes of Health uh, dedicated to studying these environmental risk factors um, that are effective, um, that, are, that are affecting other neurodegenerative diseases as well. So very active in that space as well, very important. And so, you know, as I wrap up talking about the federal side of things, this slide kind of provides a nice overview of some of the things that I talked about, but I will just kind of point out one thing that I didn't talk about um, is sort of this access to care bucket. It's a huge category, a huge bucket um, of issues, policies um, that we also are taking into consideration and that ranges from things like supporting telehealth, supporting health coverage, prescription drug costs. I mean really you think about it, you name it, um, a lot of things that talk um, that are considered with access to care um, and health care. So it's not just again you know li limited to the things that I've mentioned today. It's not an exhaustive list. There are many many things that we are supportive of and kind of are continuing to take a look at as time goes on. Perfect, so I've talked about federal priorities and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about our state team and give an overview of the wonderful work that they do and the policies that I know they've been working tirelessly to support. In the same vein of what I've had, um, some policy wins for our state team as well. Five states uh, have now passed legislation to create Parkinson's research registries. It's Maryland, Missouri, uh, Nebraska, Nevada, Ohio um, as well. I'm from Ohio, so I'm quite, quite proud of that as well. And these research registries, they operate sort of like the CDC program that I mentioned. They collect data in a safe, uh, protective, and secure way, right? 
um, about Parkinson, those living with Parkinson's, to be able to aid in our understanding and research um, available to others. Also, another success that we've seen, over a dozen state legislatures have introduced legislation legislation to expand health care coverage for biomarker testing, right? I talked about the great breakthrough of the Parkinson's biomarker, um, and as awesome as and exciting as that science is, it doesn't do much good if, unfortunately, insurance companies or others don't pay for it. So that's something that we're working very, very actively to get in front of with our state governments, even our national folks, to make sure that those tests um, and those it applies to any therapeutics or different treatments that come down the line as well are covered appropriately by insurance. And also, nearly a dozen states have introduced bills to extend protections against discrimination based on genetic test results. Of course, we know that there are many different genetic risk factors for Parkinson's, and so we want to make sure that there are robust um, protections in states to make sure that there can't be discrimination based on, on those results or perhaps your predisposition um, to Parkinson's. And so just kind of quickly, you can take a look at here some other things that our state team is working on, you know, funding Parkinson's research and creating research registries, as I mentioned, access to biomarker testing and expanding genetic testing, as well as I mentioned, prescription drugs, social determinants of health, which are very important, particularly from a health equity standpoint, supporting mental health. You know, we know not only sort of in a post-pandemic time um, with the challenges and the uptick that we've seen in mental health, but I think we all um, know well and recognize the mental health challenges in the Parkinson's community, not only as a byproduct of your diagnosis, right, but also with some of the neurological and pathologic challenge, challenges as well there. So very important to support mental health. Um, and then as well, environmental transparency, which we've talked about a lot as well. Perfect. Well, I have talked a lot and a lot about different policies and different things that we have been working on and that the Parkinson's advocacy community is working on broadly, but I think one of the most important questions is what can you do, right? How can you get involved for advocating policies you've heard about today or the advocacy pol or about, excuse me, policies that you may have in mind that are important to you or that may come down um, the line in the future? And so just our organization, we're engaged in a variety of different strategies and tactics and opportunities um, that are there. Your advocacy can depend on your time, your expertise, your interest level, um, and it's really for us, it's sort of a choose your own adventure approach that we like to present to folks. Um, our director of advocacy likes to call it a menu of options for advocacy. I really like it when she describes it um, like that. But it's for different ways that you can work with us to engage, but also to learn about other ways you can advocate along the way. And so we kind of generally categorize our advocacy in the following ways that you'll see here. Storytelling, that's a huge, huge, huge piece of this. Um, that is not something that I truthfully or genuinely can provide when I'm going into meeting with offices, right? I can talk a lot about these statistics, these numbers, kind of what is smart policy, X, Y, Z, but I can't really bring this storytelling, this human element. So in that vein, you can call, you can email your legislators, your legislators, all of which we have tools to help you do that a little more conveniently. You can attend different meetings, town halls, councils, right? You have opportunities to do media, which we can help facilitate. And when I say media, that might sound a little scary or a little intensive, but you know, writing op-eds, letters to the editor, blogs, social media, um, helping to repost things or to do posts um, of your own, if that's something you're, you're savvy at, or even our communications team does a lot of different videos, sort of video testimonials um, that we like to collect. Relationship building as well, that's huge for the work that I do and for advocacy. And so, you know, I'll have some different ways to contact us here at the end. And again, you can always come find me outside, but let us and other advocacy organizations um, as well, I might add, let them know about any connections you may have, um, a friend through a friend, through a business owner. You never know about ways, even through different degrees of separation, that you might be um, connected to a legislative staffer, a member of Congress, or somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody, right? It goes down that, goes down that chain of events. Um, you can attend town halls to meet these people um, in person, particularly um, as the campaigns and the election season ramps up. Some of those opportunities will present themselves. Um, you can even, uh, for some folks, have the opportunity to testify at different, at different hearings or public meetings about Parkinson's 
um, and the needs of the community. Um, and you can also, something I think is, is really cool, and I know that a lot of folks do on these calls that I lead with elected officials is, you know, if you have the time, if you have the audience with a staffer or with their member of Congress, you can invite these lawmakers um, to your support groups or boxing classes. We've seen some folks um, and some different members of Congress attend these classes. I think it's been a really great educational opportunity. And then lastly here, and still, again, related is sort of our digital advocacy. Um, our action alerts, which is really just a tool um, that we send out to where you can more easily, you know, call, write, email uh, your legislators, as I mentioned earlier. We send out different informational and update emails on progress and things that you can be doing, ways you can be plugged in, surveys, petitions. We currently have a petition to pass the national plan, which has over 25,000 signatures, and I'm hoping to see that number tick up a little higher after Parkinson's Awareness Month. Um, and then again, participate in our social media campaigns as well. Here's sort of a quick overview um, of a lot of the advocacy resources. And again, I'll point you to where you can, you can find these. And I have some resources outside at the front table that have these links um, on the web to where you can find. We have really a very robust library um, of different resources and what we call our action center. Excuse me. And we have policy one pagers, some of which I have outside state policy one pagers and again you'll find these action alerts that are sort of announcing an issue a cause um, that you can partake in and write um, to your members of congress or your legislators and that also extends to your state representatives um, as well and then we have a different uh, lots of tools and resources an elevator pitch uh, worksheet you know your quick stump speech about an issue help you to formulate that as well as sort of an advocacy 101 presentation to where you can sort of take some of these things and, and train yourself on the best ways to to advocate also ways to have relationship and interaction logging remember that relationship mapping and connections that i mentioned we do advocate training sessions um, if you're interested in joining some of these meetings with your elected officials that i talked about you can get signed up there, and as well as upcoming events um, that we have um, both digitally and across the country as well. Perfect. So coming up closer to the end here, here's some ways that you can get involved. I think one of the easiest thing, and if you're able to write this down, take a picture of it, or again, I have some resources out front that have this on there. But you know, on our site at michaeljfox.org slash advocacy, you can find, definitely sign up. Sign up for our Parkinson's Policy Network. That's where in kind of a one-stop shop, we can send you an email with all the different um, opportunities and ways to be engaged there. Again, that's such a great resource for any and all things I've talked about um, in our advocacy and public policy space as well. But for our foundation more generally as well, you can join Team Fox and join our grassroots fundraising efforts at teamfox.org. We also have a buddy network where you connect with folks, um, share tips and build relationships at the Parkinson's buddy network.org. Um, and also we have sort of a clinical trial finder and a tool that maybe you could find useful if that's something that you're looking at um, doing at michaeljfox.org slash join study there. So I can give it a few more minutes in case folks are writing some of these down, but just some great resources. Perfect, fantastic. And additionally, some more resources I wanted to point out. We do um, quite a number of webinars. So again, michaeljfox.org forward slash webinars. Check there quite often. We're regularly updating some of the opportunities there. Podcasts, if that's your thing. I know I quite often love to listen to podcasts um, instead of all the mountain of books that I've neglected to read. Um, having somebody speak to me <laughs> about the information is quite easier. Um, as well as sort of an interesting Ask the MD uh, thing that we have, a movement disorder specialist discusses Parkinson's research and care through blogs and videos. Um, and again, you can see the link there. Um, pretty great resource also. And then the last thing that I'll mention again, I know I'm giving you a million links and a million different ways to get engaged with us, but if you ever have any questions or you're looking for even particularly some consultations or some advice on you know, advocating, getting involved, um, or any inquiries really at all, this is our general policy team um, email. Please feel free to shoot us an email um, and we'd be happy to get in touch with you and you know, find ways to work together to improve the quality of lives uh, for the millions of Americans um, that live with Parkinson's and for their families and their care partners. 
And so with that, I will say thank you. And I do believe I have some time here for a question and answer. If folks have questions, we'll do my best. I think we may need a second to get the, thank you. Perfect. Looks like we have a question. Okay. Um, it's nice to hear about advocacy and funding, and I'm wondering if there's any uh, monitoring going on as far as outcomes. So the question is, she's just wondering if there's any, um, any, what did you say? Any what? Monitoring as oh. far as outcome. Monitoring as far as outcome. And sorry, what was the last word? Like outcomes right now, monitoring as far as outcomes yes. in, in, in something specific. Okay. In treatment, cures. Yeah, okay, yes, thanks for clarifying. So I think it's such an exciting time right now, right? And when we think about our clinical trials and our research, and again, I am not a scientist, so hopefully I don't say anything out of turn, but with a lot of the discoveries that we've had um, with the biomarker and different and better and faster ways that we can study, that alone is one huge outcome. It's gonna really accelerate treatment, therapies, cures, but I think maybe what you're getting to is, you know, unfortunately, I think we all know that the gold standard of treatment, right, carbidopa, levodopa, decades old, right, secondarily, we have deep brain, deep brain stimulation, which is a fantastic thing, but perhaps, you know, it's an invasive surgery and it may not be right for everyone. Everyone has to make their own determination there. And then outside of that, you know, I, I think I don't have to convince anybody that unfortunately there's sort of a, a lack of options, right? So we're really excited that there are many, many, many things that are currently in the pipeline, a lot of work. You know, unfortunately, uh, I don't think we yet um, have anything that is just on the verge of being um, available to folks. But I think something I do want to point out, what really gives me uh, hope, particularly when I talk about the national plan, right, and I talked a little bit about the work that Parkinson's has done, or excuse me, that Alzheimer's has done, right, and how we've modeled that. I think really importantly, you may have seen that Alzheimer's um, has recently had, I think, three or four different medications that have come to market just in the past few years, right, and those represent the first ever sort of approved treatments that show some efficacy for Alzheimer's. Now, if you m remember what I said 10 years ago, right, Alzheimer's was kind of embarking on this journey um, that we are. They discovered their own biomarker 10 years ago. They had their own national plan 10 years ago. So now they're starting to see a lot of these benefits pay off with treatments. I think it's a really encouraging um, step that we can think about some of the overlap um, in the timeline there. So I'm really encouraged and we do have a really great we call it a drug pipeline report that really captures a lot of things um, that are in the pipeline, that are being studied, that are in clinical trials, that's on our website as well if folks want to take a look at that. I see. Hi. Um, I was looking at the the yeas, and the, the nays, and the presence, and it was like 400 yeas, nine yeas, mm -hmm. and nine presence, and two of our senators are nays. No, so in terms of your senators, so that, thanks for bringing that up actually, yeah, so I think the picture that you saw there, it was 407 in favor, I think nine against, which I think you were pointing out, the nine there, unfortunately. That was the House bill. So that was the vote for the House representatives, so not your senators. They haven't had a chance to vote on it yet. They haven't yet. We've had some great conversations with their office. No, I'm in no way saying that they're opposed to the bill. They just haven't officially hopped on as a co-sponsor. They haven't officially put their name on it and said yes. And I think what you were getting at, too, kind of talking about those nine that voted against it, you know, unfortunate to see that. But, hey, at the end of the day, I think we're focusing on the positive things. We only needed... 220 some to get it done and we got 407 uh, excuse me four yeah 407 right so we're going to focus on the positives there there's always some folks that uh, 
have things to say, um, no matter what we're looking at. So appreciate that question. But yes, please do. Um, you can go onto our website, reach out to your senators, Senator Baldwin, Senator Johnson. Like I said, they're fantastic. We've had some really great conversations um, with them. It's just, there's a lot going on. There's a lot on their plate, but you can play a part um, in trying to get that through and on their radar. So thank you for that question. Perfect. I think we see one here, and then we have one, so I'll try to whoever. Oh. Okay. What is the name of the pesticide you're trying to get banned? Yes, yeah, so I think I mentioned. Yeah, apologies. Was there more to that? What is the pesticide? Yep. So I think I mentioned two, so it's not just limited to the two, and I wish I could give you a a more exhaustive list. Again, I'm not an expert in all things, but yes, the two that I mentioned was TCE, trichloroethylene, um, as well as Paraquat, um, which is another one as well. Some other ones that come to mind, I didn't talk about them, but you may have seen it in the news as well. There's a chemical called PFAS, P-F-A-S, um, that's used in a lot of different applications, particularly military applications, could be one of the reasons why our military men and women are at a higher um, likelihood of developing Parkinson's. Uh, but chemicals like that, those are three I mentioned, the first two, TCE and Paraquat. Is there any brand names, such as Roundup or anything like that, would have this in? You know, I'm not quite sure um, about that, but I will say there's a lot of different linkages that are being drawn, so I'd have to check specifically. Uh, but like I said, even some things um, like particulate matter in the air or drinking well water, which likely has to do with some of the, the ground seepage of these chemicals, shows a higher risk of Parkinson's. So I think a lot more study um, in that field is coming out, and so I think another reason to underscore why Continued research is so important to understand these linkages. You mentioned one of the initiatives was to uh, secure access to health care, right? Is, is, is there anything specific for people of color that is being utilized for? I, there, there's very little information on, on people of color, uh, how to educate and uh, move forward. The research. Okay, so the question is, is there research being done for people of color? Is there any an additional information or anything like that in regards to that question? Yeah, excellent question. Excellent question. So um, one of the breakthroughs that I failed to mention is actually a great example of that. Um, a global coalition of folks I've talked a lot about genetic testing, about genetic risk factors, right? And I think that's an important piece of thinking about health equity um, as well, because we have actually discovered of one of these risk factors, um, a gene, a risk factor that's common in those of African descent, right? And I think shows a lot of different reasons to better understand different populations. And so whether it's race, ethnicity, young onset, gender, of course, we have a lot of sort of the, the stereotype, right, of what Parkinson's is, right, older, white, male, right, which I think all of us in this room can attest that that's, that's not the case. Unfortunately, it's a disease that does not discriminate, and so absolutely, there's so much work in the field that's uh, focused on health equity um, and kind of uncovering some of those areas that maybe perhaps have been ignored in the past, so excellent question. Perfect, sounds good. I think we are at time. I wanna thank you all for your very thoughtful questions. This is a fantastic event, so a round of applause for those. And thank you again. If you wanna to talk to me, I'll be out front for a little bit. Thanks, folks.